Hello, BookTube. Recently, Michael K. Vaughn did a video on various book formats and his relationship with them and his varying levels of affection for them. And Troy Trata uh, swooped in and made a video of his own about book formats. It was fascinating. Both videos were fascinating. I love this discussion. It's, of course, perennial now that readers have a variety of options to choose from. Uh, and I thought I would make a response video. Not only because it's a fun subject, but also to give you a kind of a generational counterpoint. Because when you watch Michael K. Vaughn's video, and then especially when you watch Troy's video, you're going to notice something about their videos. In addition to all the, the fun books that they hold up, and in addition to all the fun points they make, you're going to notice something that is a quality that Troy and Michael share in common, which is that they are very old. It is very clear in their videos that they are easing quietly and without a lot of fuss towards the final stages of a human lifespan. <laughs> and so, there's a huge amount of nostalgia mixed in with what would otherwise be a cold Vulcan assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of various formats. If you are straining your eyes in order to read a flimsy old paperback of a book because... It, that's the format you used when you were young and um, a, a young boy with cheek of tan from the provinces. Well, then a, there's a large amount of nostalgia going on there, you know, and maybe that's unavoidable. Maybe form follows that particular function in humans with anything, with books or with anything else. I would be very curious to know from you if you read certain things in certain formats only because of nostalgia. I would think that I think that would be fascinating, uh, but I wanted to go through the discussion myself and uh, and preparation because someday I dream of being an adult booktuber. I have a whole bunch of props. <laughs> I have a ton of props to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, one book in many different formats. I thought about what book I should use. One that came to mind is the Bible. I, I was looking at my shelves, thinking, okay, well, what book do you have in a large number of formats? And the Bible certainly is one of those, but I, I settled on uh, on something else, a, a, another kind of Bible. I settled on the Lord of the Rings. Uh, here we have the Lord of the Rings in a lovely paperback. This is a very rare example where a movie adaptation cover is actually good looking. That's actually done with a certain amount of understated grace so that you don't mind having a movie edition. That's not usually the case. Uh, the simple paperback movie adaptation of uh, the Peter Jackson movies, Lord of the Rings, doesn't have the French flaps, and it also has exactly what you would expect of a movie adaptation cover. It has an out-of-focus production still of a Nazgul on a horse. A totally boring cover. It's blue and black, there are no details, it's all fuzzy around the edges. It was just slapped together. But this, no, this is, this is rather nice. Well, I see this uh, used, I grab it. Uh, this is one way that you could read this book. Right? A print trade paperback. This Lord of the Rings, for those of you who are maybe finding this video 10 years from now or are not much into uh, reading fantasy, Lord of the Rings is one book. It's not a trilogy. It's, it's meant to be one book. It's conveniently broken up into trilogies because its separate parts have separate names. But uh, nevertheless, this is a, prop a proper way to do it. Uh, this is not an anthology. In other words, I've heard people say, oh, you have oh, so you have Lord of the Rings all in one volume. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do, because Lord of the Rings is one volume. Uh, but this is one way that you can do it, as a big, fat trade paperback, big, floppy trade paperback. There is another way that you could do Lord of the Rings. I don't have one myself, because I have been pruning my books. Another way that you could do Lord of the Rings would be in a big, fat, one-volume hardcover. It would be bigger even than this. It would be a huge thing. There are many, many examples of this that you can find on secondhand markets on Amazon or eBay. You could get yourself a hardcover Tolkien today. Uh, that's another way that you could do it. Some of them have tactical advantages, uh, fold-out maps or I original illustrations. Some of them don't. Uh, and it, it fits the book because the, it's just one book. So you could find it that way. But typically, Lord of the Rings is broken up into three books, into a trilogy. It was done a long, long time ago in these big white trade paperbacks in a box. So you slide those out, and you read them each, and you slide them back in. But it was also done very popularly uh, as mass market paperbacks. 
there we have the uh, uh, all four books. <laughs> you can see these things get they take a beating. These box sets. Uh, but here you'd have the same thing. They they slide out. You get the individual books. You read and then you slide back in. You can of course get the individual mass market paperbacks as well. They don't have to be in a box, but they come in this size. Uh, I want to show you the various options here before we discuss them. There are three other options that we could do here. Of course, in it, when we're talking about printed books, there's also the oversized, ornate, extremely elaborate gift edition of Lord of the Rings. I'm leaving those out. Uh, the next three options that we could do are electronic. Uh, and one of those, probably the most convenient, certainly the most ubiquitous, would be to read the Lord of the Rings on your phone. It's entirely possible to do. You just you put the book on your phone and just read it that way. Now, this is an iPhone 6S. It's literally half the size or less of current iPhones of the iPhone 11 or 12. So with those later iPhones, you'd have even more real, screen real estate. You'd have a lot of room. It wouldn't be, is this would be tiny to read on. Although I've read whole books on this without any problem at all. Uh, but this would be one way to do it on your phone. Uh, another way to do it would be on your tablet. Uh, which is, you know, considerably bigger. This is probably a third bigger than the biggest iPhone, the biggest current iPhone. So you've got a, a bigger format here, far more generous for the eye. But uh, as long as we're talking generous for the eye, you could go with an e-reader, right? You could go with a, a device that's designed for not straining your eyes, uh, which uses e-ink, and you could just read it that way on an e-reader. Uh, and those are a whole bunch of different formats for this book. Formats and also delivery methods. And if we go through the pros and cons of these various formats, I think a clear winner emerges. <laughs> if we strain out antiquarian nostalgia, <laughs> if we strain that out of the equation, I think a clear winner emerges. For instance, this is incredibly uncomfortable to use. It, it will slide out of its dust jacket, it will ding and scuff and rip, it is, you can't conveniently put it in a bag, you can't conveniently carry it around, you can't conveniently rest it on top of you, it's, it's, The Lord of the Rings is an example of a book that is simply too big. It's too unwieldy to use in a big hardcover. Uh, I know there are plenty of people who do, but I, I think that when they do that, they are just blinding their mind to how inconvenient it is. To say nothing of the fact to the inherent inconveniences of print books just in general. Which I've gone over many times on this channel before. They take up lots of space. They weigh a lot. A uh, hardcover of Lord of the Rings would weigh a lot. On your shelf, it would attract dust and silverfish and mice. And it doesn't give you your bookmark. Even if it has a cloth bookmark, even if it comes with one, which the hardcover of Lord of the Rings tend to do, it, that can pull out or end up in the wrong place. Uh, an electronic book reminds you, it opens the book to where you left off. Also, uh, The Lord of the Rings, this isn't The Lord of the Rings, I know, I keep holding this up, but I don't have a hardcover of this book. Uh, and The Lord of the Rings is full of reference points, full of them. It's full of terms that crop up once, and then maybe once, and then maybe once again. And I myself don't know of an indexed version of Lord of the Rings. I think we'll have to wait until it goes into the Penguin Classic line or Norton Critical Edition before we get an index. Which means that when you have a hardcover of Lord of the Rings and you are, let's say, uh, in the middle of the Two Towers and you suddenly want to know, you know, where are the troll fells mentioned? How many times are they mentioned in this book? I could swear I've read a mention of them that seems inconsistent with what I'm reading now. Or, how many times does Glorfindel appear in this book? or the Prince of Dol Amroth. Well, if you ask that, so to speak, metaphorically, if you ask that of a big hardcover of Lord of the Rings, it will remain as silent as Balin's tomb. <laughs> it will not answer you. It will not help you in any way. You will spend forever paging through. I think I remember. It was on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. Electronic book, you can simply ask it. Anything like that, you can ask it. Also, if... Uh, if Tolkien uses an odd word, an, an obscure or odd word, as he is known to do, you can ask an electronic book what that word means. You don't have to just glide by it in context or close the book, hopefully with your bookmark in place, and go to a dictionary and hope that the dictionary has that word. For instance, when Gandalf reads the Scroll of Isildur about his 
his his uh, fascination with the ring that he has just cut from the finger of Sauron. Isildur says that well, that it was hot when he picked it up, that it burned his hand like a gleed. Did readers in the 1960s know what a gleed is? No. Do people now? No. You long press on that word on an electronic file, you'll get a, di a dictionary definition. <laughs> no long pressing here. You can long press your heart's content. Nothing will happen. This is not an interactive item. <laughs> That's one thing. It's unwieldy and heavy. You go to the slightly less heavy version of the trade paperback. Uh, and what you're gaining in portability, you are losing in durability. This trade paperback has gone through just the beginning. I, I read my way through this chapter by chapter. Probably not at a much faster rate than you would read it if you're reading it silent to yourself. And it's already got wear and tear all around the edges. Uh, so if that bothers you, it doesn't particularly bother me. How could it, considering what I do to books? But if that bothers you, that is an inevitable fate of having a trade paperback. Also, this is physical, and has weight, and takes up space, and gathers dust, and silverfish, and mice. And also, like with the hardcover, it is not interactive, does not help you at all, doesn't have any expandable features of any kind. If it's late at night, and the this is too small type for you, too, too bad, you're out of luck. It doesn't change. It's not an interactive book. It, it doesn't change at all. Uh, then we get to the uh, the other versions here. We have, for instance, the trade paperback version. Uh, as you can see, this also will take its share of beating, and uh, trade paperbacks are a little bit dicey with their spines. Uh, I could not open one of these things all the way, or I would crack it so completely that pages would start to come out from the text block. And I know that. So I have to remind myself to be very delicate with this. And because I'm doing that, because... Uh, <laughs> for you for you type A personalities in there, I did indeed put it there out of order. <laughs> and, and I don't care. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, there's no annotating. There's no way to annotate something like this. If you're already worrying about the, the integrity of the spine, you're not going to open it big enough to annotate. And I, I annotated this trade paperback of Lord of the Rings uh, quite a bit for my latest read-through. Uh, and the same thing is true of the, uh, the mass market paperbacks. It's nice to have a little box set, but these things are not going to stand up to punishment. They just they just aren't. And they're virtually mass market paperbacks, despite the misty-eyed hymns of praise that Michael K. Vaughan and Troy Tradup both gave them, are almost almost unusable in terms of annotation. And the the, uh, the type font is pretty small. That is that is that is uh, that will strain you late at night. Uh, I also put that together wrong as well. <laughs> so so th those things share their limitations. They also share the limitations of their entire family of physical books. They don't keep your place. They don't help your reading. They don't change their font. They don't carry their own light source. Uh, they take up space. They get damaged. No matter how careful you are with them, they get damaged. They get chipped and worn. The books themselves age. The paper ages. Sometimes, In some cases, the paper in this, this, old, this trade paperback set is ancient. I, this is what I read it originally. This is this is what seventies something like that. The paper here is really bright and really clean, but also a little brittle. And then we move to the electronic versions, uh, like for instance, uh, we'll go back to the uh, the phone. Uh, obviously, the, the the drawbacks here are that you're on your phone all the time anyway. You're on your phone way too much anyway. Your phone is the central location of your time waste. For most people. They waste a lot of time in the day, and they waste it in a lot of different ways, but the central location of their time wasting is their phone. So that is an argument right there, a very strong argument not to read on your phone, even the, even if you have one of those big, monstrous new iPhones. It, th there's a strong argument not to read on your phone, because the book might ensnare you, but a whole bunch of other things want to ensnare you as well here. And also, it tends to be smaller, and you can increase the font size, but you get to the point where you have five words on a single page, a single screen page. And uh, if that's true with your phone, it's also true with uh, your tablet. This is bigger and brighter and more colorful if you've got a colorful Lord of the Rings cover, a cover that you like to look at. Uh, you'll get that in much greater display on an iPad or a tablet of any kind, but you can see the drawbacks. They're the same as the phone. Maybe not with phone calls, but with everything else. 
your iPad is begging you to go away from this book. It's begging you to leave the book behind and do other things. Like, for instance, it's three in the afternoon. Have you yet today watched any Instagram videos of people falling off roofs directly onto their crotches? <laughs> Have you watched any videos of cats being really surprised? <laughs> if you haven't, you're going to feel an urge to do that. <laughs> it's a carefully built urge. You, those things have been designed to be sticky. Those websites have been designed to keep you on them as long as possible so that you look up and an hour has gone by. And I have, a, I have thousands of books on this iPad, but I also have something from the 20th century that a lot of you are not going to understand, almost like I'm talking about owning a Palantir. I have a thing called self-control. <laughs> and the 20, if you were born in the 21st century, you absolutely do not know what that is. You absolutely do not have it. And so you're, the tiny little wisps of it, the embryos of it, need as much help as possible. They're not going to get that on this device. This device and your phone and other devices like this, are really they really exist to eat away at any fugitive little beginnings of self-control. They want you to belong to the device, not the device to belong to you. And you run that risk when you're reading on an iPad. I know a lot of you are big fans of reading on an iPad. So am I. Uh, I would be willing to bet, I, I haven't done any scientific research on the subject, but I'd be willing to bet that the people who most like reading on their iPads are older, not because the iPad is easier on their eyes, but because they have a bit of self-control. I think that's the reason why the usage skews older. Could be wrong about that, but the, the emails that I've got on the subject lead me to think that once upon a time, it was kind of in the standard toolkit of being an adult that you could control yourself. <laughs> anyway, oh, that leaves us with one other option, doesn't it? And that is this. This is a Kindle Oasis with the, uh, the, larger, the larger form factor here. The battery is encased in this little, this little grip, uh, and it has physical page turn buttons, unlike the Kindle Basic or the Kindle Paperwhite. Uh, this thing is a few years old now. I absolutely love it. It, it actually has kind of stepped out of the dust of the constant vying for which Kindle, which e-reader just in general, will be the one that I'd reach for. I just love it. I love the sleekness of it. I love the Star Trek feel of it. And uh, the, the main drawback of this, of this item, the thing that most people complain about, is that its larger size and its brighter screen and its more options, uh, that large battery, requires a lot of charging. That you'll go through a, a battery charge on your Kindle Oasis much faster than you will on your Kindle Paperwhite. That's absolutely true. But it's not really an issue for me. I can see where it would be for some people. They want to throw the Kindle in the bag and have it always work. Going on a two-week vacation, for instance, you don't have an adapter plug for Europe, and you don't want one. You just want to read for two weeks. Well, the Kindle Paperwhite, you charge it fully before you go. It'll be fine for two weeks in you know Florence or whatever. Whereas this would not. You would need to bring a charger. Uh, so I can see why that would be a, defi a deciding issue. For me, it's not because I don't do stuff like that anymore. My traveling days are over. So I have a, a, an Oasis charging brick and cord right by the bedside in the little book room and right by the fainting couch here. In the two I have two of them. I have one in each place where I will need this thing, where I'm ever going to have it. So when I'm in that place and I'm not using it, then I plug it in. And it's, so it's, it's always charged. And this doesn't have any distractions. E-readers all, all have a kind of uh, beta web browser, but it's intentionally clunky. It's stayed beta all this time for 15 years for a very good reason. Because these things are designed to insulate you from, isolate, from distraction. They are designed to be a little magic play box where you pick these things up, whatever it is, whether it's a a Kobo or a Nook or any of the Kindles, you pick this thing up and you are going to read. You're not going to do anything else. You would have to stop reading in order to do something else. There's nothing else that this thing will do. And it isn't backlit. It won't burn your eyelids. It won't do anything like that. It, does, it isn't calling you to do anything except read. I think that's why, regardless of what form of the device you use, I think that's why this has so many passionate devotees. How many times have I heard from people since I started exploring the world of dedicated e-readers, how many times have I heard from people two things? One, that I, this was a life-changing product. This was a life-changing person. So this is not, you know, a, a rice cooker or, or a, you know, a toaster oven or anything where I'm, yeah, I'm glad I had it and I, I, I sorted through different models. 
but it changed my life. I have heard people talk about this technology in different terms than, I've talk, than they talk about any other technology that they buy. That's one reason. And the second reason is directly connected with it. The reason that they do is because they read more on this. It's always nearby, it almost never needs charging, and it is very comfortable to read on, and it's always there with no distractions. Suddenly you are deep, deep in a book where if you were reading it on your iPad, you'd be checking to see if you have new email, you'd be checking to see if there are more surprised cats on Instagram, or worse yet, if you have notifications set up on your devices, it would be telling you, hey, somebody just responded to this and called you, a, you know, literally worse than Hitler, or whatever. Just a side note here, you should turn off all notifications on all of your devices. You're not all that. You're not missing any emergency calls. Go into the settings and turn off all the notifications. Your device should not be asking you for attention. That is going to condition you Pavlovian style. It is beyond a shadow of a doubt that that will be true. You are you, a living organism. You will be conditioned by that. You don't want to be. You don't want your device teaching you to do things. You want to teach your device to do things. So go into the settings and shut off all notifications. But the beauty of an e-reader is that you don't get any notifications. You're locked into the book until you decide to turn it off and go do something else. So I think we have a clear winner here. Uh, unfortunately, in Troy's video, I'll, I'll leave a link. Like I said, I'll leave a link to, there, to Troy and Michael's videos because they're both great. Uh, in Troy's video, he says he thinks he's done with Kindle. He says in his video that he's done with Kindle books. I hope that doesn't mean he's just never going to use e-readers again. Uh, maybe he is. Uh, maybe not. I very seldom have I encountered someone who learned that e-reading works, that you can get lost in a book, and then went back and said, no, it doesn't work for me. I thought it did, but it doesn't anymore. I very seldom encountered that. But leaving out Troy for the moment, <laughs> it's clear that we have a winner. This is the better mousetrap. This is a better way to read books. It is not heavy. It does not take up space. I have Lord of the Rings on here. I have Silmarillion on here. I have the Letters of Tolkien on here. I have the whole of the history of Middle-earth on here. And I have, oh, I don't know, 500 fantasy knockoff novels of the Lord of the Rings. They're all on this one device. They don't add to the weight at all. It's 5,000 books. That's as many books as I have here in print form. All easily searchable, all easily findable, far more easily findable than, uh, what was that Joseph Simon book? I know, what was its title? I know I have it here somewhere. How I wish I could go up to these shelves and simply call out its name and have it answer me. How many times have I gone through that in the last 150,000 years? This thing, I can literally do that. I can go to my library and say, I know I have a book that has daffodil in the, in the title. I can't remember any more than that. Good luck with that in a print collection. Here I can simply type daffodil into a search function and there it comes up. Anything that has even D-A-F-F -F will be in there. So, <laughs> we have a clear winner. This is the better mousetrap. This not, does not require bookmarks, does not require updating, does not require dusting, is not vulnerable to silverfish or lice or mice or whatever. Uh, isn't isolated, it's not a dead object, it, you can interact with it, you know, where have I seen this name before, what does this word mean, how is this word translated, you can translate stuff, you can make text to speech so that it will, it will read to you if your eyes are too tired even for this, comes in all sorts of formats that will fit your reading desires. Yes indeed, booktube. <laughs> when we're talking about book formats, if we leave out the we used to wear an onion on our belt. This was a style at the time. <laughs> if you leave out the old man nostalgia for mass market paperbacks, then we have a winner. And it's your e-reader. So don't give up on them. <laughs> Go and try them, break them out, charge them up, try it again. If you give it an honest try, and you still prefer your print and paper books, well, then you did what you could, and the only thing left for you to do is wipe that e-reader, factory reset it, box it up, and send it to me. <laughs> so there you go. A little disquisition, disposition on the forms of books. Tons of forms. More than ever. I didn't even touch on, on audiobooks here. So lots to choose from, and I hope lots of further discussions. Take me, especially if you have a BookTube channel, take me through the different formats of your books. You must have an e-reader. You probably have a tablet. Hardcovers, paperbacks, mass markets. I, take me through the formats of a book. In Michael K. Vaughn's video, he uses War and Peace. 
feel free to come up with an example of your own. And take me through the pros and cons in your own mind of what these things are. I think if we leave out the the uh, old man nostalgia, e-readers win hands down. Simply superior. What do you think? I would love to hear. <laughs> I will I will wrap this up here and I'll be back. Thank you, Boop.